Hi, my name is Safal and I'm studying math and philosophy here at Tufts. My focus is the common structures underlying human reasoning. What do I have in mind when I'm saying this? At the turn of the 20th century, mathematicians and philosophers realized a profound connection that existed between logic and mathematics. Mainly that you could take mathematical statements and you could formalize them within a logical system like the one that had been considered by Aristotle and that these formalizations had properties that you could study by proving theorems about them. The remarkable thing about this is before this turn of the 20th century transition, logic was largely seen as something under the purview of metaphysics. Not that I consider that to be a bad word, but in the mind of many philosophers, it evokes associations with a non-rigorous, non-thorough kind of reasoning. The kind of philosophy that I'm pursuing, which is in line with the uh, tradition that Gödel and Hilbert established in the early 20th century, seeks to look at structures that scaffold human reasoning and understand it mathematically. Now what do I mean by this? Say you're solving a problem on your math homework. The kind of reasoning you use there is not going to be the same kind of reasoning that you use when you're teaching a child something, for example. Nor is it going to be the same kind of reasoning that you use when you're trying to persuade another person of your point. More technically, it's not going to be the same reasoning that you use when you're trying to allocate resources in a certain scenario, for instance, a political scenario or a computer program. All of these different types of scenarios share one thing in common. That is, there can be things that are true of these scenarios or false of these scenarios. What non-classical logics logicians study is essentially, given a situation about anything at all, how can you parameterize a system of reasoning associated with that situation? So the earliest example of a non-classical logic comes out of intuitionistic logic, and I'm going to talk a little bit about that history. Classical logic has two major rules that ensure its bivalence, essentially that every, that every proposition in classical logic is either true or false. One, you have the law of excluded middle, so it is always true that either A is true or the negation of A is true, and you have the law of non-contradiction, that is, it is always the proposition stating that A and its negation are always true is always false. For instance, if you assume the negation of a statement and you show that leads to a contradiction, you can show that the statement has to be true without actually providing any constructive reason, any constructive proof, you know, a proof that gives you an insight into the statement itself about why the statement ought to be true. And so in the early 20th century, Brewer, John Brewer, developed intuitionistic logic, a system that rejects the law of excluded middle and focuses only on constructive proofs. Now, as it was later found in the 1950s, 60s, and 70s, it turns out that this intuitionistic logic had deep connections with another area of mathematics that was rising then, and this is category theory. Now, this connection is quite remarkable, so I'll explain it. But category theory is a branch of mathematics that doesn't understand objects by properties that you look at by examining them, but instead by seeing the ways they can transform to other objects. The analogy the mathematician Rav Ravi Vakil used, which I like, is that you understand a particle in a particle accelerator by throwing it at a bunch of other at, at, at a bunch of other particles. And once you've thrown it at every other possible particle, you basically understand via its interactions everything you want to understand about the particle itself. And category theory sort of does this for mathematical objects. It lets you throw mathematical objects at other ones, and these maps between objects determine the object up to isomorphism, or up to objects that share the same maps with others, structural equivalence in a sense. The connection between intuitionistic logic and category theory turned out to be is, if you put many of the standard objects of mathematics into categories, and you look at how these categories behave internally with respect to their internal logic, this logic turns out to be intuitionistic. And indeed, it's not just normal intuitionistic logic, it's higher order intuitionistic logic. All a higher order logic is, is a logic that lets you reason not only about propositions, but collections of propositions. So you can say for all objects, this proposition has to apply and so on. And this kind of led to an explosion in the research community for mathematical logic, because mathematicians could take many of the techniques they developed from category theory, which were originally solved, which were originally developed to solve problems in algebraic geometry and algebraic topology, and apply them to logic. And so you get this categorical semantics for many logics, right? A category theoretic way of understanding these logics. 
And the reason these semantics are good is because category theory is super natural to most mathematicians working in these areas, right? Mathematical logic otherwise had the reputation of being a bit unnatural. So last summer, I started the research project of looking into a categorical semantics for paraconsistent logics. All a paraconsistent logic is, is it's a logic where your propositions can be both true and false at the same time. That is, in intuitionistic logic, if you reject the law of excluded middle, in paraconsistent logic, you reject the law of non-contradiction. And this law and this rejection of the law of non-contradiction in classical or intuitionistic logic would allow you to prove any arbitrary proposition. But ideally, in a well-behaved paraconsistent logic, you shouldn't be able to prove any proposition by rejecting non-contradiction. Philosophers have been trying to give semantics for paraconsistent logics since the 1960s and 70s. And the most popular of these options, and even before that, like, you know, as early as the 30s and 40s, the most popular among these options are many-valued logics, where, you know, you have one truth value true, another one false, and another one you, for either both true and false, or neither true nor false. The problem with these logics is that their proof systems aren't very nice. For instance, a commonly used rule that comes from the proof systems for classical and intuitionistic logic is modus ponens. Let's say you have a proof that P implies Q, and you have a proof that P is true. Then Q is true, because P implies Q is proven, and P is proven, thus Q must be proven. You can't actually do that in most of the many-valued logics. And so, in giving this categorical semantics for paraconsistent logic, I wanted to try to construct a proof system where you could do this. And it turns out that some work towards this had already been done, although a characterization was missing. Essentially, if you take any topological space, a topological space is just a mathematical structure uh, which consists of points that are either near or far to one another in a certain way. The open sets of these topological space, or sets where, you know, so sets you can just think of as containing points and containing sequences of points. An open set is a set that contains sequences but doesn't contain the limits of these sequences. So logically, you can imagine open sets as consisting of worlds, worlds where propositions are, are true, but these open sets don't contain the boundary cases where propositions are both true and false. And it turns out that if you take the collection of open sets from any topological space, these form a hating algebra. And hating algebras sort of give you the semantics for intuitionistic logic and let you do all those nice things with category theory. It turns out that if you look at the logic of closed sets, sets which contain the limit points of their sequences, you get a paraconsistent logic. Because if you look at a set and you look at all the, if you look at a closed set and you look at all the points that are not inside the set, but then you take the closure, you take all the limits, you can get that a boundary that's contained, that's shared with both sets, or essentially in a sense A and not A can be true. And while this connection has been understood for this time, the al sometime the algebraic properties and the categorical properties of such logics are not well understood. So to better understand how our human minds scaffold contradiction and how we might formally represent contradiction, I have for some time been looking into the categorical, algebraic, and topological aspects of paraconsistent logics and how they should be modeled. And in doing so, I found some intriguing connections to other subject areas. For instance, the topological semantics for intuitionistic logic are deeply connected to S4 modal logic, or the logic of reasoning about necessary and possible Positions. My intuition is that dual intuitionistic logic, which is the logic of close sets, the pair consistent one that I mentioned, will let us reason about impossible worlds, or worlds that can't be actualized. And Stephen Awodi and Kohei Kishida at Carnegie Mellon University and um, the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign have already done some of this work for intuitionistic logic, so I'm trying to see if I can extend this connection to modal logic for the dual intuitionistic case. Moreover, there are also intriguing connections to computational complexity theory. The unprovability of lower bounds for the Boolean satisfiability problem, certain lower bounds, they're quantitative, can be proven in intuitionistic bounded arithmetic, right? So it were, you know, intuitionistic bounded arithmetic is basically a restricted theory of natural number addition and multiplication formulated in um, intuitionistic logic. And it's still open whether this holds for classical logic. But in dual intuitionistic logic, we get an intriguing setup. The law of non-contradiction does not hold in general, but the law of excluded middle does. So if you take the intersection of intuitionistic and dual intuitionistic logic, you get classical logic. 
So in trying to prove these bounds for a classical logic or classical theories of bounded arithmetic, it might be productive to first construct a co-intuitionistic theory of bounded arithmetic where we can prove these, and this is what my research is trying to do at the moment. I'm also more interested in modeling how non-classical logic might manifest in cognitive or biological contexts. For instance, contradictions arise in our reasoning all the time. We deal with incomplete reasoning all the time. And so applying these modal models of non-classical paraconsistent logic to situations like belief revision theory or even biological contexts where you can assign cells as having beliefs much in the vein of what Professor Manolis Kellis at MIT is, is doing is also something that interests me. Overall, I'm interested in understanding the scaffolding and structure of human reasoning itself, developing a broad canvas through which we can understand the convergence of these topics through logic. And given how foundational logic is to the rest of mathematics and to intellectual inquiry as a whole, I think this quest will be fruitful. I think Ecolopto has given me an extremely like-minded group of people to discuss these topics with. At the recent Cognitive Hackathon, there are so many people who are interested in the IZ ideas related to logic, and it's natural. If it is a human mind that we frame the rest of our intellectual inquiry through, understanding how the human mind takes its intuitive soup and gives it rigorous shape is a first step to understanding anything else about how it construes phenomena, and it's that mission that keeps guiding my intellect. Sometimes though, studying the scaffold of human reasoning isn't enough. You need to see how different types of reasoning actually manifest out there in the natural world. And this is a key part of why I do my research at the Levin Lab under Dr. Hanan El Hazan to try to understand how networks of cells communicate with one another. In biology at large, there is an increase in recognition that intelligence could, can perhaps be understood as a collaborative effort. You know, if one agent knows something and another agent knows something else, taken together, those two agents know more than each individual agent knows. In a sense, the whole is exactly what you get when you can join the parts and these agents can coordinate with one another in ways that individual agents can't even imagine. When I look at cell communication with Dr. Hananel, this is exactly what I'm trying to examine. I'm trying to examine, we're trying to examine how cells interact in a network to solve challenges within the body. And of course, the point of understanding how they collaborate to solve challenges within the body allows us to abstract and consider how networks of agents working together might collaborate to solve problems in general. You can think of this as, you know, inputs to an algorithm, all forming a sort of network with one another and trying to use that network and leverage the computational properties of that network to come to a conclusion. This is exactly what the area of biologically inspired computing tries to do, and it's another big interest of mine, biologically and more in general, scientifically inspired computing, which is looking at actual properties, looking at actual processes in nature where agents seem to be interacting with one another to a common goal. What common features can we extract from these to build computational models, and what is the power of these computational models? I like this work because it involves a good mix of statistical work in separating the signal from the noise when looking at actual natural data, but also a lot of theoretical work because the characterizations of the expressive power of these computations, right, what they can do, is something that is more principled and more theoretical in nature. This field was started in the late 90s when computer scientists first started to look at, you know, DNA networks and saw that DNA networks could actually approximate the traveling salesman problem, but the possibilities are limitless. Like I recently looked at a paper where people look at certain classes of automata register machines and they associate these register machines with networks of chemical reactions. So it is this view of nature, it is this view of nature as a symphony where each part of nature is contributing towards a greater whole and you know, in a way that our human minds can apprehend that motivates me to study what I study at the Levin Lab. Superficially, these might seem like very different strands of work. You know, my logical work is highly abstract, but this work is highly statistical. But in fact, I see myself as doing roughly the same thing. I'm just looking at a different class of agents. Instead of looking at how my own reasoning works, I'm looking at how the process of reasoning at large manifests in nature itself. And in this sense, I kind of converge towards a Spinozist understanding or not Spinozist understanding, you know, a more Kantian or Hegelian understanding of reality as mind. Not one huge mind in the way that, you know, more, not in any nebulous way, but in really a precise way. A network of interacting components, all of which know things, but that might know different things when put together. 
And I think this is really what ties together the, the threads of my research as a whole. What can individual agents know or derive, and what can they derive when considered as a collective? And at Ecolopto, we are also mirroring this because we are a collective of thinkers who are imaginative and creative that all put out things together that we could not put out individually, but yet bring our own individual strengths to the table.